1836, this house was constructed for Francis Sorrell, and he was having it built for his second wife, Matilda, as a wedding gift. Being in the early 1800s, these Sorrells, they did have around 9 to 15 enslaved people working here at a time. And the entirety of this lower level was used as the working quarters. So, it might be my phone, it's in my pocket. So, this was the working quarters. While down here, I would definitely try to reach out to some of them. Uh, see, maybe they're cooking over here, or on both sides were different kitchen spaces. So this is where they prepared all the food and the fireplaces. Uh, maybe they're working on stuff, maybe they're cooking, see what's going on around here. The real reason I started on this spot um, was for something different. So there is an entity here, uh, one of our most famous spirits that we have, and he's the one that Joby was talking about, poking his head around the corner. We named him Shadow Man. You can probably guess what he looks like by now, because we're not that creative with our names. Every single time somebody has seen Shadow Man, though, they do describe him in the exact same way, as being abnormally tall, like seven to eight feet tall with indistinguishable features, just a very tall three-dimensional shadow. Like if a shadow came off of the wall and was walking around. Now, he can be seen all over the place down here, but nine times out of 10 when people see him, he's back in this breeze. People say that they've seen him pacing back and forth. People say they've seen him darting back and forth and occasionally just poking his head around the wall. And apparently that happened like an hour ago. <laughs> so <coughs> definitely reach out to Shadow Man, see if he's around, because I guess he is. Um, now, when I mentioned that 99.9% .9 of the furniture is super antique and really fragile and old, Shadow Man's chair is not in that category. So one thing I love to recommend to people to do is, first of all, definitely spend some time in the breezeway. Definitely spend some time in the chair. Uh, so I would break away from the rest of your group. Don't bring any equipment with you. Maybe bring some with you if you want. And just hang out in Shadow Man's chair and see what happens. We've gotten a lot of really strange reports, uh, just really weird feelings. People have said they, they felt just strangely uncomfortable while sitting in that chair. People said they felt like they're being watched from the other side. Uh, there was a more extreme case where there was a guy who was sitting in the chair for a few minutes, and then he ran into the courtyard in tears. He said he felt every single emotion he'd ever experienced in his life hit him all at once, and he didn't know what else to do. Uh, so I'm not trying to scare anyone away from sitting in the chair. It is really fun, it is really freaky, but definitely try it out. Now, I think I have everything on me. Uh, we are gonna head back this way. If you pull these doors towards you and enter the next room, I will tell you a bit about that one. You go I'm gonna make him clear rooms. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I won't, I won't go in that group. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a police officer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. So, this room was once used as a linen room. And before I really talk about it, there's a bunch of stuff I like to point out. Right over here, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so, all this stuff, super old, really fragile, and antique. So, is this stuff in this corner over here? Uh, so, just be careful walking around in here. I do know that I pretty much just invited you to come into a really dark room full of super old antiques. Um, that might not seem like the smartest thing, but I trust all of you. Mm -hmm. um, now, the couch is yeah. totally fine to sit on if you would like. That is one of very few pieces of furniture. Um, but the couch in here, you are more than welcome to sit on that if you would like. Now, the linen room is where the majority of the cleaning and the laundry would have been done. So definitely reach out to some of the enslaved people while in here. Uh, see what they're doing. Maybe they're cooking, maybe they're cleaning something, they may be working on other stuff. Uh, they were not plantation workers. They were skilled laborers who had spe like special things they were meant to do. Some of them were cooks, some of them were carpenters or blacksmiths, stable boys, all different sorts of things. Uh, so reach out to them, see what they're doing, ask them some interesting questions because they were interesting people. Now, also in this room is where one of our children's spirits, or child spirits, I guess, likes to reside occasionally. And we believe his name is Bobby. Probably one of the children of some of the enslaved people here. Um, probably enslaved himself. And a lot of people have gotten evidence of him around this fireplace over here. So some people believe maybe he's just hanging around in the fireplace, maybe waiting for his parents to get done working. Uh, so you can reach out to Bobby while in here. Um, pictures in here are really cool. Your phones 
are on airplane mode, or at least they should be. And that doesn't mean you can't take pictures. Still do that. Uh, record video, record audio, especially if you're using a spirit box and you want to hear some responses back afterwards. I would definitely record the audio uh, while, while using the spirit boxes. Now, pictures in here are really cool. Over the past few months, there's been at least four times that I know of while just giving regular tours where somebody has taken a picture in this back corner here and they have seen a shadow on the wall that neither they or I could explain. Um, there was one time in particular where I definitely could not explain it because no one on my tour was wearing a top hat like the person in the shadow was. Ah. So shadows in here, sometimes in this corner, uh, pictures are really fun. And now we're going to head to the next room. Before we do though, um, I am kind of required to say this. If anyone has any long and or dangly jewelry and it is very expensive or very uh, important to you if it belonged to someone you know, or like a family heirloom, I'm going to leave it up to you whether or not you want to remove it now. But after being in this next room, just double check you still have it. <laughs> as, I, as, I, as I giggle. <laughs> as I giggle. I'm sorry. 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 i there are a few different pieces of furniture in here. One of them is the desk chair over there. Um, really old, really fragile. Please don't sit on it. It will probably break. Also, this wheelchair. Very old, very fragile. Please don't sit on it. Will probably break. And the REM pod is in this chair. So that's not about to be comfortable for anybody. Now, the couch in this room. It's on. Hold on, Dakota can hear me. Dakota, the REM pod died. <laughs> There's a camera there, who know. Um, the couch in here is totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> totally fine to sit on. Um, this couch is one of our most famous pieces of furniture because of the things that happen on this couch. It doesn't look comfortable. It's not. Um, but if you do sit on it, you'll notice it is really loud. The springs will creak and people have sat on the couch and they've heard the springs next to them, compressed down and felt them like somebody sits next to them or do the opposite, like somebody stands up off of the couch. One time a lady sat on this couch and she said it felt like somebody grabbed her arm and was pulling her up as to lead her out of the room. Um, so that couch, super fun. Now, I don't know what happened on that couch. I, it's, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know what happens now, but I don't know what happens <laughs> so this, I know what happens in the room though, which might have something to do with it. So this room, it was used for dry storage for most of its time, but there was a brief five and a half years from 1845 to 1850 where this was used as a medical office for a doctor, Frank Sorrell. He was one of Francis's children, oh. and he specialized in trauma surgery. Oh. So for five and a half years, this was an operating room. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, hence the medical medical yeah. medical experience. I now, to know why. Somebody needs to talk to Frank. <laughs> now. <laughs> This room is particularly active. Uh, lots of physical things go on in here. Joby mentioned somebody kept feeling their, their feet were getting grabbed or their ankles were getting touched. That was probably in this room, I would imagine, because. Um, so we don't actually have enough hard evidence to make us believe that Dr. Frank himself is still here. Doesn't mean you can't reach out to him. Uh, you can try it out, maybe, maybe give us some legitimate answers. Um, but there are or we do believe, I guess, that some of his patients might still be in this room. So reach out to some of them. Um, there's also another child spirit in this room um, named Sarah. Now, Sarah, is that your name? <laughs> Sarah is the explanation for the ankle thing. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> So Sarah, we do believe that she is a, a child spirit here. Um, not really why she hangs out in the surgery room, I don't know. Um, but she does like to play hide and seek, which sounds like the plot of a really dumb horror movie, but it is kind of cool. A little bit different than regular hide and seek, though. She does have a slight advantage being a spirit. You can't see her that well. The way that you find her, though, now, usually she likes to hide underneath things, like tables, couches, different pieces of furniture. Um, so if you do go in front of a table or sit on a couch, she will probably let you know. She likes to play with people's shoelaces. She likes to poke people in the back of the leg, maybe pull on their pant legs a little bit, stuff like that, just to let you know you found her. Um, there was actually one time where somebody was playing hide and seek while using the spirit box. And they actually walked over like right here. And they're like, Sarah, are you over here? And through the spirit box, it said, you found me. 
So that was really cool, kind of creepy, but like it was still pretty cool. Um, yeah, and now the so, way you can yes. I was just gonna ask, you, was Doctor Frank a good doctor or yes. a okay? Good question because I usually say that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is probably the most physically active room. Um, one of those reasons we believe is because Dr. Frank was known as one of the best trauma surgeons in almost the entire nation during his years, mm. but he still lost more than half of his patients oh. in this room. So for five and a half years, over half of his patients died in this room. Mm. But he was one of the best. He was a very, very gifted individual. For that time, I mean, 51% mortality rate, pretty good. Uh, now. The way you can tell you're being touched by a spirit, in case anyone does. Um, so, probably he's not going to feel like a human. If you do feel a human, I would look around because it might be someone in your group trying to scare you. And the way that you can tell it's a spirit. More than likely, it'll feel like a loose hair or a spider whip. That just doesn't exist or won't go away no matter how much you brush it, kind of like a feather. It might feel like a burning sensation. If somebody had a lighter and they were holding it up to a small patch of skin, kind of like that. Or if you just hold one of your hands over top of the oil lamp, which I don't recommend. <laughs> um, if you've heard of cold spots, hot spots, those also exist. Um, it also might feel like pins and needles to the point where it stings, itches a little bit. If a small patch of your body feels like it went numb or fell asleep. Those are the big ways that people usually feel spirits. And nothing to all this. Does anybody have any questions before moving on? Mm -hmm. Cool. Man, you can push through these doors. I'm gonna turn out these lights, and we're about to head upstairs. Sarah, <laughs> <laughs> you stay down here. Your friend Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anyone is trying to get audio recordings while down here, if you're just trying to listen really closely and the fan is interrupting you, you can turn off the fan. Um, it says down here because it gets kind of warm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. So, we're going to get there. <laughs> this is what it's going to look like while you're down. Oh, so now, the you do have flashlights. Oh, okay. Okay. Flashlights are for safety and investigating. One of the safety reasons, the step that I'm standing on right now, is a lot less illuminated than all the other steps. So do be careful while walking up the stairs. Also, if you, if you think back to when Joby said somebody took a picture on the staircase, this is the only staircase people walk on during the doors. It is a bit disorienting walking into a very large house through the darkened basement. That is the front door, right back there. So anytime anyone will be entering the house, or I guess still now, um, this is the first thing anybody can see. It's also where I'm going to put this guy. So the EDI is going to be out here because in this hallway we do get a lot of reports of footsteps out here on the staircase. Now, so there's one more child spirit that is that I've introduced to you. Um, and her name is Matilda Ann. Uh, Matilda Ann was one of Francis's and Matilda's children. They did have eight kids in total, but three of those eight never lived to see the age of seven. And Matilda Ann was one of those three. When she was six years old, she did die on the fourth floor of the house in what used to be the children's quarters of scarlet fever. Um, and a lot of people have gotten evidence of her hanging around on the staircase, maybe just up on the landing up there. People have seen her like walking down and poking her head around. You can try to reach out to Matilda Ann. Um, since the EDI is going to be out here, you can try to let me turn it on now so you can see it. Try to like knock on the stairs and see if you get some knocks back. It is going to be freaking out because it's turning itself on right now. Um, so yeah, out here, ask for ask for footsteps, I guess. Now this room, I'm going to take you in for a brief moment. Uh, nothing too special about this room. is gonna be on the, I mean, tables, you can like put your stuff on tables if you want. Um, just like couches and chairs are not gonna be okay to sit on. 
Um, table's also not the case, I don't think. The floor is fine. In the next room, there's some rugs that makes it a bit more comfortable than sitting on a hardwood floor. Now, this room was used as the study for Francis. Francis was a really successful shipping merchant, big businessman, and in here he held business meetings, met with other shipping merchants, signed contracts, things like that. Not a whole lot of exciting stuff ever really happened in this room today. Not a whole lot of exciting things happen in this room. Probably what we know as the least active room in the entire house. That does not mean that you <laughs> doesn't mean that you can't investigate in here. I've had times in the past where people won't get any evidence anywhere up here. They come in here, and this is where all the stuff happens. Unfortunately, not really enough to tell you anything in particular. Um, but if you're in here, maybe just try to talk about business-related things. <laughs> why I don't investigate in here because I don't know anything. Um, now, before going before going across the hall, Yay. while up here, you may or may not hear footsteps coming from up there. That I can tell you right now is probably not paranormal. Probably an actual person because occasionally we have a caretaker on site from time to time. If he's ever around in town, he stays upstairs. He knows this is going on. He knows that he's not supposed to be loud. It doesn't mean he's not going to be quiet. <laughs> so. Whenever he walks around, for whatever reason, it's super loud. So if you hear a bunch of like really heavy, really hard footsteps upstairs, it's probably him. Um, if you hear like quieter footsteps, like someone's just like kind of peeking around, that's probably not him. Um, so there's definitely a difference. You'll, yeah, if you hear it, you'll know. Um, so that's about, yeah, that's all for this room. Now, across the hall is, is the main part. So if you're trying to take a picture in this mirror and you see a face behind you, it, <laughs> he's there. Um, so these are the parts. If you see more than one face, then <laughs> if you see two faces, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so these Sarats were some of the richest people in Savannah during their time. And Francis, he was a really successful businessman, so naturally he holds a high political status in the city. And in order to help keep the status, boost it possibly a bit more. He hosted extravagant parties all the time with hundreds of people in attendance. So they actually didn't begin in here. They began outside of the square, which they used as the front yard. Later in the evening, though, he would invite his closest friends and family, a very elite few of people, maybe 15, 20, back into this house. And this is where the after party took place. So if you're into parties, this is about to be your spot. Now, they would feast, they would drink, and they would dance to the early, early hours of the morning until there were a few people left. Then they would split into two separate groups. The men would gather over here, and the women would gather on that side. Then the pocket doors would be closed, and they would hold all of their conversations confidential to each other. Now, while up here, reach out to some of the party people. Uh, see what they're doing. Maybe there's a party going on. If you want, I like to try this out sometimes, or tell people to, I guess. Um, maybe over here, like have your have your group split up by gender. The man come over here, the woman go over there. If that doesn't work, flip it and see what happens then. Um, so try different stuff like that. If you do decide to use this this technique, one thing I ask is that you do not close the pocket doors. Um, they are the original pocket doors. They are really heavy and hard to move. So if you end up moving them, I'm gonna have a really difficult, awful time putting them back. Mm -hmm. so please don't. Now the piano. It does have a sign that says, please do not touch. That is for um, us, the spirits. They can do what they want. Um, so you can reach out and see if the piano might play. It has happened before, um, so definitely try that out. People have gotten piano music through the spirit box while asking for someone to play, which I always thought was really strange. Um, whenever I, because I've heard it twice, and both times I've heard it, there were people in this room that did not hear it, and everyone that was not in this room did hear it. I don't know why that happened. I couldn't explain why it happened, so that's what makes it paranormal. Uh, so maybe have someone in your group come in here and reach out to the piano people. 
and have other people in the group like go out in the hallway or just go over to that side and see if they hear it and if you don't and I don't know maybe that might validate my thing on people don't hear the piano in here um so the next area we're gonna have right over there to the equipment side Is going to be off limits, but it's where the room pot is in case you're wondering. Um, that's where it is up here. It doesn't have the little middle thing, um, but the red light it is on. It is working. I do promise that. It's just an older version. Now, these are the parlor rooms. They did use them for parties. Uh, they were also just the common rooms, like the living rooms. So maybe um, they're just hanging out. Uh, they are also used for wakes. If they surrounded ever lost a loved one, this is where they would hold the wake in one of these two rooms. So maybe it's a big fun time party. Maybe it's just a casual evening. They're hanging out by themselves. Or maybe it's a bit more depressing and sad and they're hosting the wake. Um, I'll leave that up to you to find out. Now, you walked into a haunted house, probably expecting some kind of tragedy, and you heard about the unknown number of people who died downstairs from surgeries. There was a bit more familial tragedy that occurred on this property in 1860, on March 27th. These Sorrells were setting up for one of these very large, luxurious parties, and Matilda, the lady of the house, wanted to see how preparations for her party were running. Usually to do that, she would ask her most trusted out of all of the enslaved, her head housemaid, Molly. And Molly was, or she had a bit more responsibility than everybody else, essentially the supervisor, told everyone what to do and how to do it. Really important that she's around, especially when there's a party like this happening, but Matilda can't find her anywhere. So she's going all throughout the house asking everyone if they'd seen her, and nobody had. Finally, the last place she thinks to look, if Molly's not in here setting up or telling somebody what to do, maybe she's getting ready for this party. So she decided to look in Molly's bedroom. Now, across the courtyard at the top of the carriage house, that is the third location. Um, but whenever it's your time to go up there and investigate, I'm going to bring each group up individually and tell you a little bit about it. Now, you'll see a big open area on the top of the staircase up there, and then off to the side, you'll see a room that's just by itself. That was Molly's personal bedroom, and the only way in and out was from the courtyard. There was a staircase that led up to a balcony which had her door. Now, Matilda goes up those stairs, and she knocks on her door, but there was no answer. So she opened it, rather than knocking a second time, and she did indeed find Molly in her bedroom, but unfortunately, she also found her husband, Francis. We can all take an educated guess as to what Francis was doing in Molly's bedroom, but it is very important to keep in mind that Molly was enslaved and Francis was a slave owner. So there is very little doubt that she would have had, or very, very much doubt that she would have had any choice in what was going on. Um, so seeing that, Matilda runs down the stairs, comes back into the house, and locks herself in her bedroom. And then moments later goes out to the balcony outside and after an argument with Francis from the balcony to the courtyard, Matilda was seen falling over the railing and landing headfirst into the courtyard, later dying from her injuries. And roughly two weeks later, these Sorrells cannot find Molly anywhere inside of the house. They decide to look in her bedroom, go up the stairs and they open the door. And once again, Molly is found in her bedroom, only this time she was hanging from the rafters. Now, there is mystery surrounding both of their deaths. I cannot tell you that Matilda was not pushed. I cannot tell you that she did not jump. I cannot tell you that she didn't faint. Um, but what I can tell you is that in a local cemetery, in Laurel Grove Cemetery, is where you can find the Sorrells family crypt, in which you will not find Matilda with the rest of her family. She has an unmarked grave somewhere else in that cemetery. Usually in the 1800s, the only reason for that would be if it was, in fact, a suicide death. Now, for Molly, there's even more of a mystery, much less documentation. Being enslaved, she was known as property of the Sorrells, not even a person. So they told everyone that she did that to herself, and that was it. There was no investigation, there were no questions asked about it, it was done. Molly, though, was around 4 foot 11. The rafters up in her bedroom, those are really tall, they're like 8 feet in the air. Very unlikely for her to have any furniture tall enough to assist her getting up or any at all for that matter. And if she were to do this to herself, it probably would not have been by hanging. In the 1800s, that was seen as an extremely disrespectful thing to do. Um, but also in the 1800s, the white man's way of murdering somebody was almost always by hanging. So that's all I know about Molly's death. And unfortunately, it will always be a mystery. And most people do believe there was probably some kind of foul play involved, more than likely somebody else. Now, 
we do believe that both of their spirits still reside here today, Molly and Matilda. So you're more than welcome to reach out to either of the two. Um, if you're trying to reach out to Matilda, I would try it up here. If you're trying to reach out to Molly, I would do it in the carriage house, maybe downstairs. Um, I get people trying to reach out to Matilda in the carriage house, and that isn't likely. Um, so I just say that so everyone is aware like where you should do it. If you do decide to reach out to either of them, I ask that you do so with the utmost respect. Um, their deaths were nothing to be taken lightheartedly, and that also goes for all the other spirits. Um, again, don't like anything negative, don't want any of that. Please don't antagonize. Now, one last thing. It is a very old house, and sound carries, and there is no way around it. So while you're up here, maybe don't stomp around or shout or anything, because whoever's downstairs is probably going to hear it. Um, same thing if you're downstairs, don't stomp around or shout. Whoever's up here, probably going to hear. That being said, investigation time. Um, do you guys want to get the party started? Sure. Cool. So, I'm going to open up this door. 